Heavenly Father, we thank you that as we have been able to gather here this morning, whether it's in person or online, that you reveal yourself to us through the power of your Holy Spirit. We ask now, Lord, as we come to your word, that you would open our minds, our hearts, that you would allow us to learn, allow us to grow. And Lord, as we are going to hear today what you have for us, Lord, that we would draw close to you, that we would know the only truth, the only way, the only life, the only redemption, the only salvation comes in and through you. And so, God, we ask and pray that you be present with us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, before uh, we even read Scripture this morning, we're going to be in James chapter 4. I'm going to give you a little bit of a disclosure here. This is a word that I really struggled with this week. You can ask my wife. Uh, And this is uh, really a hard Sunday morning message. And for all of us, uh, in different ways that God's Word hits us, uh, can be a struggle. And and, uh, I'm not going to hold back this morning. This is a very in-your-face scripture. And uh, as my old wrestling coach at North Linwood would say, uh, we know it's ahead of us, so let's get after it, right? So buckle up. Uh, if you are offended, if you are hurt, uh, it means it's doing something, okay? So uh, listen as we go to James chapter 4. We're going to be reading verses 1 through 12. And I have these uh, words on the screen. It's in the NIV translation. And we read, What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire but do not have, so you kill. You covet but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. And you do not have because you do not ask. And when you ask, you do not receive because you ask for the wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think Scripture says without reason that He jealously longs for the Spirit He has caused to dwell in us? But He gives us more grace. That is why Scripture says, God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, and double-minded. Grieve and mourn and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. Brothers and sisters, do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against a brother or sister or judges them speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you are not keeping it, but sitting in judgment on it. There is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy. But you, who are you to judge your neighbor? That's the word of God for us this morning. I give you all the warm, nice, fuzzy feelings inside. As we enter into chapter 4 of James, we've covered a lot of biblical ground in this study. We spent time in specific areas talking about our trials and temptations, listening and doing favoritism against uh, uh, forbidden favoritism, faith in our deeds, taming the tongue, and two kinds of wisdom. And recall with me where we ended last week in chapter 3. With the question of whose wisdom are we living by? Are we living by our own wisdom or are we living by God's? And what kind of heart do we have? We ended James chapter 3 with these words, verses 17 and 18. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. Remember with me, if you will, the list of the conditions of the heart that we talked about. A person with a harsh tongue has an angry heart. A person with a negative tongue has a fearful heart. A person with an overactive tongue has an unsettled heart. A person with a boasting tongue has an insecure heart. A person with a filthy tongue has an impure heart. A person who has 
a critical tongue, is, has a bitter heart. And yet, on the other hand, the person who is always encouraging has a graceful heart. And a person who speaks gently has a loving heart. And a person who speaks fruitfully has an honest heart. And we ended by asking ourselves the question, what kind of heart do we have? We have to remember that the core reality of life is that we're either living according to what we want or to what God has set out for us. Seeking our desires or God's. There are no two ways about it other than that. There's no gray area. And that comes straight into our scripture this morning. As we read those first 12 verses of James, it's interesting, and we're going to break this down piece by piece. So first, let's begin with verses 1 through 3. I want to read this again. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire but do not have, so you kill. You covet but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight, and you do not have because you do not ask on. When you do ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures." Now, the first acknowledgement that James moves into this dialogue from chapter 3, the condition of the heart and the tongue, moves straight into this acknowledgement that there's an inner battle within each of us, a battle of living for God or living for the flesh. And this imagery is given all throughout the Old Testament and the New. We, we remember, as we recall, the fall of Adam and Eve, what God says there in Genesis he says to Cain and Abel in that dialogue, he says, be careful for sin is always crouching at the door of your life, waiting to devour you. And I think it's important for us to look at those who have gone before us and, and their struggle and how they've explained it and put words to what we really live in on a daily basis. And so I want to read these words from the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 7, verses 15 through 20. Paul says this, I do not understand what I do, for, I, for what I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good, as it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. For I know that the good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. Say that ten times fast. (laughs) Paul is acknowledging his sinful, broken nature and the goodness that God has placed before him that he wants to live into, and yet he has this struggle of the good that he wants to do, he's not able to accomplish or live into because of this sinful nature that he has. To further explain this reality, listen once with me to Titus chapter 3, verses 1 through 11. And we, I, I read, Remind the people to be subject to the rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready to do whatever is good, to slander no one, to be peaceable and considerate, and always gentle towards everyone. At one time, we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, He saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of His mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit whom He poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that, having been justified by His grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. This is a trustworthy saying, and I want, to, I want you to stress these things, so that you, so that those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. These things are excellent and profitable for everyone. But avoid foolish controversies and genealogies and arguments and quarrels about the law because these are unprofitable and useless. Warn a divisive person once, then warn warn them a second time. 
After that, have nothing to do with them. You may be sure that such, a pers- such people are warped and sinful, and they are self-condemned. Now, this is a hard message as we hear from Paul and Titus and, and to what James is saying, but it's the gospel truth. When we look throughout history, even within our own lives, we see this strife and this controversy that we have to really reconcile and we have to come to terms of whose heart and, and, and whose will are we standing upon. Our own desires, our own self-seeking comforts, the luxury and, and, and nice, comfortable things, or are we submitting to God? Titus puts it straight for us by explaining God's plan of salvation through His Son, Jesus Christ. We also receive the wisdom of how to communicate with a divisive person. This brings us back to James chapter 4. So we read verses 4 through 6. James says, You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enemy with, against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think Scripture says without reason that he jealously longs for the Spirit he has caused to dwell in us, but he gives us more grace? That is why Scripture says, God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. James here is not saying that we should hate the world. Where we are and what we have is all a gift from God. God is the source of nature's beauty, of the very beat in our chest, the very breath of our lungs. But what James is trying to help us understand here is best described in Matthew chapter 6. Jesus telling us that you can't serve two masters. You're going to serve one and hate the other. We either use this world as a gift and the blessings and the opportunity that God has provided for us, or we will get used by this world. To be controlled by the world and the sinful desires of the heart is strife, is hostility towards God, is what James is saying. Verse 5 in particular, though, means exactly what it says. And yet there are two other ways that it's translated to help us understand the same result. And this is a quote from Barclay. He is that is God jealously yearns for the devotion of the spirit which he has made to dwell within us or the spirit which God has made to dwell within us jealously yearns for the full devotion of our hearts. This goes to show us that God has a great demand for us to be devoted to him. But for many, we read here the desire of God wanting us to be obedient and to submit, we say, that's way too much. That's way too much. I don't, I don't even know where to begin. And, and I am a sinful, broken person. How could I possibly step into this kind of submission and obedience? But James gives the answer and how we are approved and how we get to step into that obedience and that submission. And that's verse 6. He says, God gives us more grace. Because where there is a command of submission in our lives, we approach God not by our merit or our own righteousness or our goodness, but by His grace. God's grace is the bedrock by which we step. Only in and through His grace do we have the opportunity and or ability to be obedient and to submit to Him. And yet, James follows the answer of submission by God's grace by quoting Proverbs 3.34. God opposes the proud and shows favor to the humble. Pride is the core sin that culminates every wrong here that is talked about. Think with me in your own lives where the fights have arised, the quarrels, the arguing... Pride is the instigator in our communication. Pride is the breakdown in our relationships. And it leads to these fights and these quarrels that James is talking about. 
Now, James isn't just talking about just the individual Christian in their own household. He's also talking about within the church. That's an important thing for us to understand. That is, there has been this uh, individual Christian approach. He's also talking now and here as an individual Christian, how we interact with our families and our church. But there's a few things we need to know about pride and humility. First, let's talk about the ugly, the pride. How many of you in here do not have any pride? Raise your hand. That was a good test. Pride does not know its own needs. Pride is a self-admirer and does not recognize the need for correction. Pride cherishes this state of independence. It cannot and does not couple well with anything else. Pride does not recognize itself as sin. Pride is like a smoke screen giving people the idea that they're good and that they're sufficient. This is particularly dangerous, dangerous as it doesn't lead people into thinking that they're sinners or that they need help because pride in itself doesn't think that it needs any help. Now, there are many, many examples that I could give even within my own walk this past week of pride. Pride and prayers of celebration and thankfulness of my wife and her accountability for me. Pride is the illusion that we're not sinners and aren't in any particular sin. Therefore, it is all the more important to be in community, in the body of Christ, to be held accountable for the pride that we all fall into. But here's another way to think about it. Think with me for a moment of all the people in your life. Think about all the people that you know within your family and your friends. And I want you to think about this for a second. All of those people, why are they not sitting next to you right now? Now, I'm not talking about those in your life that go to a different church. I'm talking about the people in your life that don't go to church at all, that don't want to step foot in church. Whatever the excuse or experience or disbelief that person will give you can be boiled down to pride. Why do I need to go to church? I'm a good person. Why do I need to go to church to believe in God? I can do it on my own terms and in my own way. Why do I need to go to church to give them my time or my money? I have work to do or this game or event to attend. I was out too late at the bars. I have my own bills to pay. Why would I give to the church? Now, in no particular order did I list those out or categorize those. I share those with you as not just within my own family, but also my friends who have said that to me. I don't need church. Ultimately, what they're saying is, I don't need God. I.e., boiling down to them being self-sufficient they themselves believing that their life is about themselves. I'm fine without God or the church. This prideful interaction really really makes me think of that quote from 1637. I think, therefore, I am. A person of Christian humility, on the other hand. So we talked about pride. What about the humble person? What about the person with humility? The person that has this humility that God offers really comes into two different kinds of strengths. The first is this, as we read in Proverbs 22.4. Humility for a Christian starts and begins with this, fear of the Lord. Humility has the root words of humus, which means of earth, uh, to be humble, to 
be humili- have this humility as a Christian is to be face down in the dirt before the Lord in submission. It's to have this reverence. It's to have this awe. It's to have this fear. That's the first step of a Christian being humble or having this humility is to know that this world is not about them. We do not find our strength in ourselves but in God alone. Jesus showed us this when he was tempted in the wilderness. Do you remember as, the, as Satan is tempting him back and forth, back and forth, you do not, Jesus says, you do not, uh, man does not live on bread alone but by on the word of God. Jesus showed us there in that moment that the devil is not invincible. And he takes flight when he's confronted by the word of God. And the second of Christian humility is this. Once we have this fear, this reverence, this awe of God, we have access to God. We read that in Hebrews 4.16. Because of Jesus, we can approach God. In the Old Testament, we have the understanding that it was the high priest that would be able to go into the holy of holies on behalf of the sinners. And yet, we, when we get to the New Testament, we see what Christ has done on the cross and in the resurrection and in the ascension. We have this understanding that Christ is the high priest, that he is the conduit, he's the mediator for us to be able to come to God. Humility is the great privilege to submit to God and to draw close to God. Not to think less of yourself, but to think of yourself less, as C.S. Lewis would put it. It is a kind of courage to face the enemy and his sinful tactics by the power of God and drawing close to God. And that leads us right into James, verses 7 through 10. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. Now these verses are straight away in what they mean. And yet we, we need to clarify that James is not denouncing a Christian joyous living. Okay, he's not saying, you as a Christian, just be hum, humbug the whole time. Don't have any fun. He's not saying being a Christian is not about having joy. What he's saying is that the first step in the Christian life is the point of coming to know your own sins, that you are only justified by Jesus Christ. James is pointing out that we ought to be confronted with God and our sin. It's a daunting reality. There's some amazing stories of John Wesley preaching the gospel and helping people come to understand their own sin and and realize what they have been doing and how they've been clinging and living for the world. And there was this moment where John was preaching to minors of all people in Kingswood. These men are filthy, covered head to to toe in dust, and, and John is preaching to them. And he's reading these words in such a way that these men are struck by their own sin, that they're, they're just disgraced by how they've been living and clinging for the world and what they've been working towards, that the, the tears made runnels that ran down the grime of their face. But those moments that John preached had, the moments recorded, the moments that you and I have had that we're confronted with our sin, that's not the end. That's the beginning. That's what James is trying to help us understand, that we must come to an end of ourselves in order for life to begin. When we come face to face with the reality of our sin and the death we deserve, that's all been taken upon Jesus' life on the cross and in the resurrection. There is no other response but to fall flat on our faces on the ground. In submission and humble adoration, Because God is in the business of taking the worst of us and offering us redemption by the blood of the cross. When we come to the end of ourselves and we realize that God's love for us is far greater than anything we could ever strive for, work after, whether it's a a person or a thing. And that's the only reason I'm standing here. It's the only reason you're in this room today. James is calling out the lives of people who are self-seeking, 
who are looking to satisfy, to have this luxury, to have this first world kind of experience which we go through. He's addressing these unworried hearers to turn their love for the world and what it is into true love, the love of God in and through His Son, Jesus Christ, poured out in His Holy Spirit. It is a joy far greater than anything this world can ever offer. And it's the way God wants us to live in this world. God wants us to know that He knows us. God wants us to accept His redemption offered through Jesus. Then in turn, to go into the world and to share that redemption by being a light in the darkness. To help others see and know the truth. But far too often, we're entwined in this world and we continue to take hold of certain parts and say, Jesus, you can have all of me except this part. Each of us needs to repent daily to draw close to God and He will draw close to us. A few weeks ago, I had uh, my 15-year class reunion, Northland. Whoop, whoop. And it was, uh, it, was, it was nice to sit there and catch up with those who attended, uh, who I was able to talk with. But uh, in particular, there was a moment uh, at the end of our dinner that uh, our class president had saved all of the yearbooks through the four years and then saved all of the senior interviews. Um, and I was flipping, I passed mine. There's this young guy with hair. I was like, that's not me. I'm just kidding turn back to that. I was reading it, and Amy was over here talking with somebody, and I had no idea whose profile I was reading. And I was ashamed to actually say, hey, Amy, come look at this. I mean, I will confess to you, the question that was asked me, what am I going to miss most about high school? My answer was the vending machines and girls. Yeah, pretty embarrassing, right? The state of who I was and my desires and the things I sought and thought were important. Holy smokes. And in, in my embarrassment, Amy, she, she got a hold of it and read through it. She's like, oh man, whoo. But it is all in God's timing and the way in which God works because God doesn't want to keep us right where we're all, we are. And as I call those my BC days, my before Christ days, I reflect upon those moments of total and utter chaos, having no direction, living day by day by the desires of my heart, going after the next thrill and high or whatever it is. And you know, as we grow older, those things dissipate a little bit, but there are so many things that we still continue to get a little edge of those. Whether it's adrenaline or it's this or that, or I, I, I don't know what it is in your life. But the truth and the reality is James is talking about here is what is taking place among you? What is the desire of your heart? And it is so serious that he's saying that you, you quarrel and you fight and you do so to covet and to kill. Now, in some regards, people are like, what, what, was James actually witnessing to a church that the church members were actually physically killing themselves? And they don't believe that they were physically killing them, but spiritually, mentally, emotionally killing that other person by what they're speaking, by the desire of their heart. And so I share that class reunion story with you because we head into verses 11 through 12 here. Brothers and sisters, do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against a brother or sister or judges them and speaks against them, uh, speaks against the law and judges it, when you judge the law, you're not keeping it, but sitting in judgment on it. There is only one lawgiver and judge. The one who is able to save and destroy, but you, who are you to judge your neighbor? 
It's far too often you and I are looking through the lens of who we used to be or who that person used to be. And not looking with God's eyes and heart of, of redemption. Of seeing that other individual, whether it's in your conversations or in your actions, that God actually loves them and, and, and God has, has redemption for them. Does God want to use me to help them come to know that redemption? And you know, I thought... As I became a Christian, I knew that it wasn't going to be easy. I knew that it was going to be difficult because as I sat at that classroom, you know, people were like, what in the heck happened to you? Don't you remember this and this and this and this? I don't know about you, and I know you've been in different experiences, but when you're sitting somewhere and someone's just bringing up all of the filth and dirt and everything that you've ever done, that makes your stomach just turn. What, not just about the past, what about the present tense? In my very first time ever preaching a message, I stood up front and I fumbled my way through a sermon and I remember getting done and I was still shaking, I was so nervous and, and just drained, exhausted, spiritually emotional, all of it. And this, this woman came to me and said, Andrew, that was, such a, that was such a kind message, but you know, we really miss you being in your blue jeans sitting down here with us. That's where you belong. Or in the moments of serving two small congregations as Amy and I were engaged and, and before we moved here, they, they have good hearts. They, they, they took Amy and said, hey, Amy, we want to take you shopping for pastor wife clothes. Here's the point, and they're good intentions. You and I, we tend to say a lot of dumb things. We tend to hurt one another. We tend to fight over things that are not important. May it not be for us, brothers and sisters. That is Titus says you fight and quarrel over genealogies. That, trust me, the fight that we have just come out of is a good and trustworthy and honorable fight for the Lord's word. To stand firm, to stand anchored in the truth of the gospel. That is a fight we're never going to stop. But in the midst of our conversations with one another, where is there within our lives pride that needs to be repented of? Where is it in our interactions with one another that we're harboring bitterness or grudging or, or grumbling or we're gossiping about that person? Now I confess to you and I stand here as I've talked with so many of you, I make mistakes all the time. I am a sinful, broken man before I was a pastor. I'm still a sinful, broken man and a pastor. You and I have a great opportunity to live into this thing we call church, this thing we call family. We have this great opportunity to rub elbows with each other, not in, in a way that slanders or is quarrelsome or is fighting, but in spurring each other on. As iron sharpens iron, how are we building each other up? As we read in Colossians, how are our conversations seasoned with salt? I truly believe God is calling us has called us and is pushing us into this beautifully unique congregation. Together, thick and thin, no matter what. That isn't going to stand upon arguments of genealogy or this or that. But to know that we have more in common and agree on more things and believe together and can serve God's kingdom here in our community and communities that need us yet. That you and I can walk through these doors and invite anybody else to walk through these doors and not place a judgment of this law and the judgment that James is talking about here. To love that individual right where they are, despite their circumstances. Because we all have circumstances. 
And we all are in the need of the redemptive blood of Jesus Christ. We're all in need to accept and receive the power of the Holy Spirit. I believe with all of my heart, God is doing something amazing. So I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you, brothers and sisters, to keep fighting the good fight of faith, to continue in His Word, continue in prayer, continue in the work of the kingdom of heaven here on earth. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you now in all of our vulnerabilities. Lord, you tell us you know every ounce of who we are. There's not one thing in our lives that's hidden from you. So God, we humbly come before you. And God, I ask and pray that if there is someone here that's not submitted themselves to you, that we do that together. Each and every single one of us humbly submits our lives before you. And the way we do that is simply by saying, Lord, I repent of my sin. I repent of the ways in which I have made you my enemy. God, I acknowledge what you have done through your son Jesus Christ by giving him as a sacrifice for my sins on the cross. That he has died in my place. That he has resurrected the firstborn from the death. And that you, Lord, offer us eternal life. So God, I accept that. Move in to my heart. I submit myself to you. If you are somebody that is just spoken those words for the very first time. Or even if it's been a while, we rejoice with you. We rejoice in the redemption of Jesus Christ over your life. Eternal salvation that is at hand. God, we praise you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.